Hello, my name is Dima Daman. I'm a professor of computer vision at the University of Bristol. I'm here to tell you about a story worth sharing, uh, which is the Epic Kitchens project story. Thanks to the organizers of this fantastic ICCV workshop. Uh, and here I'm gonna tell you really about a project that we started here, the motivation behind it, and then importantly, the lessons learned. So the, um, the talk will start with the background. Why did I decide to take this project forward to carry out this amazing project, in my opinion, the Epic Kitchens project, the motivation and the story behind. And then I'll give a quick summary of the project, which is important for the lessons learned. And then more on the impact the project has had, what happened beyond it, particularly for research, as well as the team that had collected the data set. In the background story, a little bit about where I started with research and the picture has a meaning you'll see shortly. I did my bachelor's in computer science between 98 and 2002, a while ago, and then did my master's in what was then called distributed multimedia systems. And this was my first encounter with computer vision. At that time, the project we were asked to do as part of the computer vision module was as actually to take a picture of um, the hands and then to start counting how many fingers particularly can we see in the image. And we did that via Sobel edge detectors, tracing the edges, finding minimas and maximas. So all this <coughs> old school approach to computer vision. Interestingly, despite the challenge, I really, really enjoyed it. And that's what I did my master's project on, which was on person VID. After a three years break, I started my PhD. And that was my, my first encounter with video understanding. So during my PhD, I actually did two projects. The first, as in the slide on my background, was on bicycle theft detection. I was looking at videos of people coming and locking bicycles onto bicycle racks, and then people taking them out. The uh, application was detecting thefts, but the real interesting challenge was to try to link the event of the person connecting the bike or locking the bike um, at the beginning of the day to the person connect, leaving, uh, picking it up later in the afternoon. And also as part of my PhD, I, I did an, uh, also another surveillance project on detecting carried objects. The real motivation for what you see me and my group doing now started from uh, my postdoc. During the postdoc and carrying from this activity understanding uh, research that I've done as part of my PhD, uh, I did a postdoc as part of an EU project and the EU project was on understanding activities in industrial settings. Um, Marcus here, which was one of the collaborators on the project from DFKI Germany, is uh, demonstrating what we call the wearable setup. Um, so he's wearing all these different sensors and cameras and also virtual reality. And at that time, depth was very, very new. So we had this ET style prime sense that was uh, hanging on top of his head and had to be up there because it needed to be at least 60 centimeters from the bench where the industrial setting is actually taking place. And this is when I saw these types of footage for the first time, um, how clean that footage was, how clear was the action in contrast to what I have been doing with surveillance cameras. And I thought, this is where we can do action understanding with minimal AI. So without trying to guess what the person is doing, we actually can see the action taking place. And then when I started my research group, um, uh, I actually started collecting more and more of these data sets. So between my postdoc in 2011 and April 2017, which is where the Epic Kitchen story started, I had collected four different data sets, either myself or in collaboration with PhD students, really focusing on people interacting with objects using different types of sensors, um, depth sensors in the kitchen, indoors and outdoors. And I was really very familiar with how we collect these data sets, how we label them, what are the issues, what are the expectations, and Bioid, which is the data set that we collected last, was a decent sized data set for people interacting with environments in a lab setting. And then my research was really focusing on interesting questions like, what are the people doing? When are they doing it? How can we describe what they're doing? What type of verbs do we use to describe actions? And some work on skill understanding um, as people interact with objects in the world. So in 2017, I did one of what I called research tours. I basically visited research labs 
to present our work, but also to see what they're doing. So I carried out a trip that started from the University of Maryland. I went to Toronto, CMU, and MIT, I think within probably two or three weeks, um, visiting the labs, presenting what we're doing, and then also discussing potential collaborations. And in these four places, at the end of the talk I had presented, there was one common question that came up immediately at the end of my talk, which is, what's the size of these data sets that you're talking about in egocentric vision with wearable cameras? And my answer to every one of them, which is, well, we don't have ImageNet, the data sets are you know, decent size, we can still do some um, learning or deep learning with them, probably with some frozen layers in a CNN, but they were not big enough. So the first question came, the second, the third, by the time I was asked the question the fourth time, actually at MIT, I thought, that's it. I need to do something about this because this question will keep coming. Whatever innovation I would do in research in this area, there will always be this question of what's the size of the data set that you can actually either train or evaluate on. So I actually took the flight back from the US to the UK on the 24th of April, 2017. And throughout this um, eight hours flight, I was thinking of one thing, how can we do this? How can we at Bristol with what was a small size group, really small, collect a large scale data set that can showcase the potential of the research that I was planning to conduct over the next five, 10 years. So I took this flight, I hardly recovered from the jet lag, and on the 27th of April, and I actually had to look at my calendar to pick up these dates. I knew they were close, but I looked at my calendar to look at exactly what the dates were. On the 27th of April, I was in the lab and I met with a team. And the team was actually five individuals. One of them was me. Toby was on a one-year postdoc halfway through. Hazel was a first-year or first-year PhD student. And then Mike and Davide were second-year PhD students. And that was the team. And I sat around the table and I said, we will collect the largest data set in egocentric vision. And I think you can imagine like this small scaled group um, and, and, and the, the notion of the horror of the potential, like how can we collect the largest data set in egocentric vision? And over my flight, I actually had a plan. I knew that in October, that is actually nearly six months down the line. In October, we're gonna have three starting PhD students that had brilliant talent. They would be joining the group. And I thought we will have this support from September onwards, September, October. I also knew that we cannot collect the whole data set in Bristol because that will be not very you know, uh, international, that would be big enough. I knew that Davide was actually going that summer for an internship at the University of Toronto. Um, and I thought, okay, we will collect some data at Bristol. Then Davide during his internship will collect some data at the University of Toronto. I also knew we had a brilliant researcher, Antonina Fernandez, coming from the University of Catania to visit us in Bristol over that summer. And I thought at the end of that summer, Antonina can go back and also collect some data under the same regime or theme that we'll set up in Catania. So between Bristol, Toronto and Catania, that was the starting plan that we've set up on the 27th of April, 2017. And really we had to set the plan in action um, the team was interested, we were scared, we were all scared, but we were re really, really keen. They saw the potential, they saw that there was a plan and hopefully I knew what I was talking about. And the plan will really collect a very different data set and novel as I'll tell you more a little bit about. So 27th was this meeting, 3rd of May, I actually had a meeting inviting 10 people in the lab who could collect data for us, telling them about the protocol, what we think they can collect. They're gonna take cameras to their homes, explaining to them what we're after and seeing the reactions. And actually on the 8th of May was the first person collecting the first data set. And over the next year, I felt, I always said I was like an orchestra a person who's just kind of making sure everything goes to plan, everybody's doing stuff. And at the same time, thinking about the research because they could not pause their research completely, making sure we can build on this small, but really impactful and very, very skilled team that I knew I had. And on the 10th of April, 2018, that's less than 12 months, but really intense and um, actually lots of fun, but uh, lots of hard work, we uh, released Epic Kitchens, which indeed was the largest first person data set still is 
um, in egocentric or first person. So this is the story, this is the motivation. And perhaps the lesson learned from the motivation was, if you are asked the same question multiple times, think about it, people may, you have to do something. You can't just step back and say, I'm too small, or maybe I'm not capable of solving that. If that's an obstacle to you achieving your research goals, you have to do something about it. So this is the Epic Kitchens project. And I need to tell you a little bit about the project. You can read more about it on the webpage or in the relevant publications. Um, but how the project was carried out, the orchestra I've just described, is important to understand you know, the lessons learned out of the Epic Kitchens project. So this is the project. Giovanni and Sania were the PIs at uh, Catania and Toronto. And this is the team over the years. Also, Jin joined us at Bristol. So this is the team that collected Epic Kitchens. We started by, as, as I told you, giving people cameras, taking it to their homes, and asking them to do a natural collection. That is, collect everything you do in your kitchen. There is no script. We haven't asked them to do a specific dish. Just everything you do in your kitchen for three days. Um, start collecting the moment you walk into the kitchen. Stop as you walk out. And this was really the spirit of the data set, which is to get some natural data, very different from the data I had collected before, or I had played with before, where it's a lab setting, there is a predefined script. People would be following either an activity script, which is prepare this meal, or an actual more detailed script, like pick up the cup, the cup now. Either way, these were scripted actions or activities, and we wanted something completely unscripted, which is we don't tell them what to do, we get what exactly they're doing, and importantly, it's not in the lab kitchen, it's in their kitchen. Of course, coming up with this innovative idea, so not only collecting a large scale data set, but a data set with this innovative approach needed a little bit of thinking about scalability. The reason people don't do this data collection first is because it's really hard then to annotate the data for all the actions and all the objects because you don't even know what the classes are and how you can understand uh, whether to train or test this data set. So we came up with this pipeline, uh, which is a scalable pipeline that starts with a data collection. People talk over the uh, data set using these live narrations. And this was inspired by all these subtitles that were coming out of YouTube and movies and replicating the same sense, but by people actually watching their videos and scripting them. And then from that, we had this pipeline to collect all the annotations via Mechanical Turk, I told you in April 2018, we released the first version. But even from 2017, I knew that we could not do that once. We had to do this twice, not only to ensure the data set is big enough and as big as one would hope to train and test, and not only to fix any errors we might encounter in the first round of collection, but because I also had some research questions I wanted to address and I wanted the group to address that would not be sufficiently uh, satisfied with this first collection. So the second collection was aiming around domain adaptation and understanding how we can use models in the future with the expected domain gap that might happen if I collected data now and I try to test it a year down the line. So immediately after we finished Epic Kitchens, probably less than a year later, we started the second round of Epic Kitchens where we extended the data collection we improved the way we annotate. We improved our annotations to be denser and far more accurate. Even though the first, the first collection of the data set was, I always hear from people how accurate it was. We even worked more on that. And now we have Epic Kitchens 100, which is the current version um, that if you want to download and play with the data set or test the challenges you would be working with. So this was the project's pipeline. And it's important to link how this idea was linked to the individuals. First, it was really risky to aim merely for scale. That was when I took this flight back from the US, I said, we want to collect the largest data set. But I don't know who else is also trying the same idea. Maybe other people also have been thinking about it. Maybe there are universities in this whole globe that are actually collecting a large enough data set. If I come back to the researchers and I tell them we're going to collect the largest data set, and six months down the line, a large scale data set larger than us, say by one of the key players in the field comes out, 
then all the effort we would have put, all that effort the students and the researchers would have put, would have you know gone completely um, away. So we really had to think better. I had to think about something that's not only scale, something that will ensure that even if we couldn't achieve the largest data set, that the data will be so different, so unique, that the data set will be well appreciated and the work of the team will be you know, rewarded. So thinking about that and inspired by everything that I wanted to do, not to collect yet another large scale data set, particularly because of this risk towards the researchers' times, I thought, okay, how can we collect a distinctive, novel, different data set? And I, um, even though the idea is, before I saw this workshop, I liked this uh, slide from, from Alexander's talk in CDPR 2020, because it really explains why we collected the data differently. Typically in computer vision and machine learning, you start with a problem, say object recognition. Then you go and you want to collect a data set that you can use to train and evaluate that task. Um, and from that, you select a number of classes, you go to the internet, you find examples of these classes, you add them to the data set, and you keep going until the data set is complete. So this is the ImageNet recipe and the recipe that was used in a number of video data sets, say ActivityNet amongst others. Once the data set is ready, then you divide into a train and test, you train the model, and over time, researchers would be trying to decrease this error or increase the metric, say the accuracy on your data set. And that loop keeps going until you have a bigger data set. And then one realizes that, you know, maybe the methods were not yet, yet good enough for this bigger, bigger data set. Um, the problem with this scheme, despite its power and its impact on our research, is that you would overfit to the data set and it's useful for only one task. It's biased by all these choices the researchers had put into the classes they want to collect data set, the data set within. And it is unnaturally balanced, which is very good for machine learning, but not really very helpful for people doing anything useful with computer vision. And unnaturally balanced means that you expect the same or nearly the same number of examples per class. This is completely unrelated to the priors you would face in finding, say, these classes or these examples in the world. There was one exception that inspired me to put the pipeline for Epic Kitchens, which is the Kitty dataset. So the Kitty dataset started with putting cameras, driving cars around, and once the data had been available and annotated, then a series of potential tasks could be tested in this dataset, whether it's flow, whether it's tracking, whether it's semantics, whether it is segmentation, et cetera. So that was the idea. Let's collect the data first, and then we can use it. And by doing that, we actually created a novel data set and an interesting pipeline, and we decreased the risk just in case someone else was also collecting the largest data set in egocentric vision. By the time we completed, there wasn't. There was really another group that was collecting, but they even were a smaller version. Um, it was again another lab setting, a brilliant effort, but another lab setting. So the data set ended up being novel from all aspects, plus the largest data set. So how did we do it? <coughs> in the first round of the data collection, as I told you, Davide was collecting the data in Bristol. He was also collecting it in um, Toronto and he was help, you know, telling Antonina how we collected it. So he could also collect the same version in Catania. In the second round of the data set, uh, Johnny actually did the data collection. And that's really important that when we did this again, we kind of shuffled and played with the order of with the people's roles just to increase the challenge because, you know, David had done it, he's not going to learn anything new. It was a new experience for Johnny to take charge of the data collection, talking to the people, explaining what we want to collect, etc. So these were the head mounted GoPros um, that we agreed early on that you know, having tested a few things that this is what we want to collect with. And um, these are examples of the data we've collected from 37 participants. I don't know how well the video is playing, uh, but you can have a look at the web page for examples. Um, it's really fantastic, the type of footage. So I think the biggest impact Epic had is when people saw the types of videos that are being collected. And these are the tricks that I told you about, how we collected different data sets. So this is two years on, the same participant actually in the same kitchen doing here the same activity. And the question is, if we had learned a model from um, 
2018? Can the model still work in 2020? And there were subtle differences, right? So, so what you can see here, for example, is the natural changes, like the person is, is just using a slightly different um, uh, washing liquid, right? So does it then recognize these normal or natural changes? This is another example, again, uh, from the same kitchen two years later. And in this case, there is a microwave two years later that wasn't there or in that place before. And then these are my favorite settings, which is the same person who had moved kitchens. So actually, it is the same person. Some of the actual um, the tools here, like the pan or the spatula, are the same. But the kitchen had changed. The oven is different, and the kitchen is actually different. Um, so that was also one of the interesting questions. Now, the same individual actually wearing the same watch two years later in a novel kitchen doing very much the same task with some of the same tools. Can we do a good enough task in doing any of the uh, tasks we're after, whether it's recognition or retrieval? And again, this is the same example, the first um, sprinkling mozzarella on pizza, the same participant, a different kitchen. Luckily, students and postdocs move kitchens a lot. So we had a good number of people who moved kitchen and we were asking them to record we didn't ask them to repeat exactly the same task, but these are good examples you can see of people repeating the same task, but in a new environment. And the data set eventually was 100 hours, 700 videos collected. Right, so Will really designed what we kept referring to within the group as the annotation pipeline. Um, I was really good at you know, refining it, making sure we have versions of it, sometimes to, uh, too keen on making sure that it's perfect. Uh, and that really helped us. That really was critical to ensure that, especially as we collected two years later, that we still had a path of how to follow. So what we wanted to start with is, is the video. And what we needed is all these aspects of um, start and end times, the narration that the person had set, which is a short explanation of what they've done, uh, the tracing of verbs and nouns, and then the clustering of these into classes. And this is Will's slides that I'm borrowing just to tell you about how we can how you can put a team in place um, and make sure that there are tasks and everybody knows what they're doing and there is a flow of progress. So there were uh, you know outputs that we were after and there were processes that you can achieve. So these are the processes and then these are the outcomes. Um, so one of the outcomes is to take the videos out of the collection and then collect narrations. And this was led by uh, Davide also with Johnny and with uh, Will, and this is was using this interface. Pick up pita bread. Put down pita bread. So we decided to collect these annotations by audio because it's a lot easier for the annotators, but that means that we had to transcribe, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, and sometimes translate these. Then we had to take these narrations from this, we had to actually transcribe and translate sometimes. And we actually had to show people examples of the footage so that they don't make an mistake. There is the common flower or flower. Is it a flower or is it um, what you use in cooking? Uh, the, what you smell or what you use in cooking? And you really had to see the examples to understand what you're hearing. And then there are the start and end times, which Vangelis had led. And all these interfaces were designed by us because we really wanted to make sure that they are, so that we can test them and that we can over time define them. And then uh, Mike was really, because part of his PhD was vision and language. Um, also with Will worked on the parsing, figuring out the actions, figuring out how we can find from the narration all the verbs correctly. And we then had to look through all the free form text that we're getting and group these into what we called clusters or verb class or noun classes, because for example, Put or place is the same, knife or blade is the same. We don't want them to be different classes, even though we have the three form text as well. And this was really done mostly manually. There was some initial automatic stuff, but there was a lot of manual effort. And I think this is an example from the second round of collecting the data set. What you see here is a long, very long um, set of, of clusters that we were refining. We were doing it manually and digitally. We were really thinking about whether to combine or not combine, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of putting maybe fat within meat or not putting it, uh, where to put certain things, what is it, a juicer could be 
automatic or could be manual. So there was an amazing effort and that really taught us a lot about the data and about some of the problems that we have been working on since then. And that's me trying to kind of keep track of what's happening. But as you can see, everybody's doing more hard work than I was. Um, I was in charge of actually designing the train val test splits. Um, I thought I looked through the whole data set and then it was very important to think about the test set in both iterations. And it was from the very beginning that I wanted that the first test set from 2018 will become the validation in 2020. This is part of the initial design of the two-stage collection. And then in the test set of the latest test set, we were keen to make sure that the test examples had good lighting. They were sufficiently long to be able to test some of the challenges like forecasting. We had a lot of washing up, like people do lots of washing up in the kitchen. We wanted to balance how much washing up there is in the test set. Um, we wanted some unseen new participants in the test set, so you generalize to unseen participants. Uh, how much you have out of zero shot actions, and importantly, actions you can recognize. So you've seen the verb, you've seen the noun, but then the combination is new. So the zero shot compositions, all that was done really uh, through careful thinking about that step. So this is the pipeline, and that's what resulted in Epic Kitchens. If you want to know more about the data set, then please look at the web page. Um, I am kind of wanting to tell you the story of how we collected it in order to inspire the, the lessons learned, which I know is the main intention of the workshop. And I hope you haven't seen the first stage as like a research description, because I think the lessons learned are very much about how we, um, how we managed, given our size and given the expertise that we had, and given the various levels of um, stages in research that the students and the team had, how um, did we manage to collect Epic Kitchens? And I have 10 lessons to emphasize that I hope you will find applicable to other large scale projects you might want to either lead or be part of. So the first uh, lesson is you really can't do it right from the first time. If, if I was collecting Epic Kitchens without having collected those other data sets over the previous five or six years, um, Epic Kitchens would not have worked. You really need to try things out and figure out what is interesting and what's not interesting, where the errors are. We did labeling of narrations. Uh, we did start and end time well before doing Epic. We knew many of the basic blocks. We had tried them before. We knew what works and what doesn't work and what are the challenges. I sometimes see first year PhD students and I talk to them and I say, how are you starting the PhD? And they would say, I am collecting a data set. And of course, that's particularly fine in terms if you want to practice and, and have it as a playground, but you really can't do it right first time. If your PhD advisor meets you on day one and say, go and collect the data set, I think you have to wonder if that is the right decision. And if this is the only way out of your PhD, you really need that data set because there isn't anything out there. You have to find the right collaborators who had done something similar before. Otherwise, you will have to be, you'd basically be spending a lot of time making lots of mistakes and the outcome will not prove useful. So you really can't do it right from the first time. Experience is critical. One goal is too risky. And I told you about this story of, I didn't only want to collect the the largest data set. If you set a large scale project that has multiple people involved and you think about one goal, which is say scale, then someone else might beat that. And then you're nervous and the chances of making, uh, you know, rushing because you don't want anyone to, to be ahead of you. And then um, basically someone else actually jump in the ship. If you don't do that, if you think differently, which is how can I do something really good with multiple goals. I want it large scale, but I want the data itself to be multimodal with audiovisual in people's homes. I want to think about my scalable narrations. I want to collect in multiple environments. Every bit of the pipeline is novel that really decreased the risk. So in case someone else had collected a large scale egocentric data set, it was very unlikely they would have ticked all the boxes that we were ticking as part of Epic Kitchens. And you can think about this lesson in any project you're thinking. Don't aim for only one goal, or sometimes people call it low hanging fruits because then someone might 
you know, do something ahead of you. Think about really what is novel, what's interesting, and one of these potential goals will prove fruitful. Uh, you can't undermine the importance of planning. Uh, planning, planning, and then replanning, and then planning again, and then thinking why you can improve, how you can improve the plan, and why things are slower. Um, and there are many methods you can use. For example, um, Will really got us all to use Trello, and, and this is the sample that I looked at from uh, what we had, which is we really had different stages. Every participant, the videos of every participant was a block, and we were kind of moving them along the pipeline. Are they in the object annotations? Are in the action? There were a lot more stages. This is just a screenshot. So plan, plan, keep track of what you're doing. Are you ahead of your schedule, behind your schedule? Is there a bottleneck? How can you refine it? How can you ease the effect of the bottleneck? Do it yourself first. Without giving you exactly which participant I was in the data set, but I was one of the few first participants to collect data and I did it all. I collected data and I figured out what are the issues in the data collection and what mistakes people do and what are issues with the viewpoint. I recorded narrations, I narrated my, my data, I annotated data across the whole pipeline. If you don't do it yourself and you assume that it will work, it is not going to work. You have to do it yourself first. And then once you know all the pluses and minuses, you can skill. That's another lesson that I think um, was really critical. And I think I did it right. And only in reflection, I realized how critical it was that we did this one right, which is knowing your team's strengths. So you have natural strengths of individuals. Some might be good in communication. Some might be good in details. Some might be good in speed. They can do things really quickly. Uh, some more reliable in terms of checking quality. Knowing your team strengths and building on them is really critical to do a project. And that we know. But then there is another aspect with it, which is don't make it too boring. Because if someone is really good at it, you haven't really expanded their skill set. So there has to be a percentage, say 20% of what you're doing, where you're actually testing new grounds. Maybe you haven't tried this person in a particular skill. Or maybe you know this is not part of their strength, but it's time that they actually try to challenge themselves. So testing new skills for individuals is really important to showcase, to basically make sure that they learn and not only it is the project's goal. 80% has to be building on people's strengths, 20% trying, and then keeping an eye, checking that you know, you've done it right, and then replanning just in case this does not work out. Be there, and I think the picture is quite representative. Um, you have to be there if you want to lead a team on a project, whether it is a research project or even a PhD, in my opinion. Um, part of actually advising, and I like the term advisor more than supervisor, is to be there, to be present, to be able to question stuff and ask and know what's happening. Probably a bit more of a micromanager like the picture than I should have, but definitely being there is a very important lesson to learn. Checking for quality early enough and to do it yourself. As in, you can't really hire people to check for quality of your project. This has to be something you need to spend some time doing. Despite all the planning, you have to expect and accept errors and to be very, very welcoming and say, that's an error, that's absolutely fine. No, um, you know, you can't really blame people for making errors when you're doing an innovative project, right? Errors will happen and you can't put the blame on one person. You've seen that we have a pipeline. You can't say, oh, this person was in charge of this step. So the error is their mistake. That is the worst thing for the team spirit. Expect errors, accept them, uh, support, the member of the team because they really feel horrible if they had caused a mistake or or they you know lost something along the line um be very very supportive accept the errors and replan uh, at some point there was something that we had to sh to shift i think in epic 2020 we had to shift three or four months down the line because of an error and that's absolutely fine you just accept um that some errors will happen and um be very supportive for the person who feels that the mistake is theirs because it's not really 
that individual mistake, it's part of the planning, or maybe you've given them too much work, or you haven't considered other factors, you didn't check early enough, etc. All this effort would not have had the impact it had had if we didn't think about how well to advertise for it. And I think for those of you who've seen um, the Epic Kitchens, the first Epic Kitchens um, trailer, um, this is the revisit of something you probably had seen three or four years ago, um, three years ago now, yeah, three years ago, uh, but I tend to enjoy watching it again. So this is the first Epic Kitchens trailer. And we did other merchandise, like uh, you might have met some of us seeing us wearing these huge badges to celebrate Epic Kitchens. We did these, um, these short boards, shopping boards, uh, which we now all members of the team have, etc. cetera. Um, I think the reason I say advertise, advertise is because really there is a lot out there and the impact of talking about your work, highlighting it is massive. We did everything. The music was done by, by, by my brother. I think it's the first time I'm acknowledging and thanking him for the music he's offered us. It was an original music that probably some members of the team couldn't hear anymore at some point because of how much we've repeated it. Um, Toby did a brilliant job in basically designing and uh, the, the, the Toby and, and Johnny did a lot of effort in basically making it a, a proper trailer. Um, we all contributed, but it was really, we really wanted a big impact and we did achieve a big impact. You can watch the second trailer, which again was another challenge. We had set a very good trailer. We needed to get another good trailer. Um, and I hope that people have enjoyed both of them. Finally, the project doesn't finish by the time you push the button and tell people about it. People will contact you and ask questions of all sorts. They could be a master's student that you just think, okay, I'm not gonna explain to you what a data set is, but could be someone who genuinely needs help to use some of the annotations or an error they had found. Um, we really, if you email the um, UOB Epic Kitchens email, you know that we, you receive responses within a day. Um, and if you put a, an issue on the GitHub, you also know that we have uh, really offered brilliant support, I hope, uh, but very, very, um, we're very keen to make sure that we offer sufficient support to people who use the data set. So these were my lessons learned. Let's just review them. You can't do it right from the first time. One goal is too risky. Plan, plan, and replan. Do it yourself first. Know your team's strengths, but also take some risks so that they learn new skills. Oh, there's a typo here. Be there. Check for quality yourself. Expect and accept errors. Advertise and support. What impact has this project had made and 
I hope some of you who know of the project have seen the impact, but just a quick summary uh, before we conclude. The data set has been downloaded by researchers all around the world. I'm always excited by knowing about new countries and researchers who've downloaded the data sets from these new places. Um, the web page had until now, I think this was even June or something. Yeah, June, 2021, uh, 30,000 viewers. The annotations are fault that people use them often, whether the first version or the second version. We had the first round before the pandemic of the winners of the challenge. So these were the first set of winners, along with some members of the team who were there in Long Beach. And you can look at the technical report. And over the years, we did the last two rounds virtually. This is the 2020 challenge, um, where we have three uh, challenges, three benchmarks to look at. And you can look at the technical report. And, and this year, because of the Epic Kitchens 100, um, the scale, then we had five challenges, and these are the winners. And we have, I think, an 85 pages technical report if you're interested. The five challenges we currently have, which will be also the five challenges for 2022, will be recognition, anticipation, detection, domain adaptation for recognition, and that's by this idea of collecting data two years later, and multi-instance action retrieval. And people can submit to the benchmark. We've set the uh, leaderboards to actually take one submission a day with a maximum of 50 when the challenge is open. And for example, we had 147 submissions to recognition um, over the last year, in the last round. And this is just an, again acknowledging that every bit, we also have new people uh, this year who take took responsibilities for the challenges. Dan was part of the recognition challenge. Adriano was part of the retrieval challenge. So as the team grows, now we're bringing new people new researchers in the team to actually help with the Epic Kitchens challenges as more researchers move on to the next stages in their career. But really the impact of Epic, um, you will see more of the impact of Epic. Coming soon is an Ego4D data set. This is um, led by Kristen Groom and Jitendra Malik, but really it's a collaboration, very much inspired by what we did at Epic. Ego4D is a team of 14 universities along with FAIR, and the data set is coming very soon. If you would like to attend, I don't know which day is this workshop compared to the EPIC workshop. The EPIC workshop will be on the 17th of October, and you will hear the first um, set of talks about the Ego4D data set that's coming in November. And I think the best example of any data set is to tell you more about the type of footage. So this is some of the footage that we collected in Bristol as part of the Ego4D data set consortium. You can see that we we still have some cooking tasks, but we also have um, crafts, arts and crafts, um, other types of cleaning, gardening, sports, walking, pets, etc. Keep an eye, and I think just seeing after Epic Kitchens, this idea that you can give people cameras, they can take it to their homes, they can do stuff, has been very inspirational. And the research impact of what the team had done, um, just believing that all these brilliant researchers are now interested in doing this, um, this task is, is, is amazing. Um, beyond the impact, before I conclude, and I don't know how much I've taken of your time, I really want to talk about the personal impact that this has had on us as researchers, me as well as members of the team. We always laugh that we, in conferences or in talks or when people come, they, we get asked this question, are you epic? Um, I was asked, are you epic? Um, which is amazing. People know of the team. They always tell us how happy they were of the quality of the data set, how interesting the project is, or how nice our trailer was, or um, etc. How, how impactful the data has been to triggering novel research that maybe beyond the challenges we had set. Personally, this is this is I think equal as important as the research impact that people have appreciated the individual effort we put, and that has really impacted the students the most. They've done a lot of work and, and to see that impact. I cannot underestimate or you know, talk enough about the team spirit in the group as a result of collecting Epic. Uh, being in a research group, you usually have enough competition in other researchers or in other teams outside. You don't want to have competition within your research group. You want the team to feel that they are supportive of one another, and that they help one another. The team spirit as a result of doing EPIC 
uh, is impressive, is amazing. People help one another. We review each other's papers. Even if you're not on the paper, someone else would help read the paper and give you advice. Um, the caring aspect uh, has significantly increased. Of course, the individuals are great. So I don't think it's only the, the project, but I think the project has really strengthened the team spirit and has really impacted the skill set of the team. So now if you look at the CV of any of the people who collected Epic, they can add things like, I not only collected the data that I ran a challenge, I presented in, in a webinar, I uh, actually you know, did a technical report out of people's um, submissions to the challenges. So it really had expanded the skill set of the individuals. And I know that I always receive emails saying, do you have any graduates of the team um, who have collected Epic because we're keen on hiring people with that skill set. And importantly, I think the project had allowed potentially future leaders, the researchers who collected the data from the very beginning, as well as the current researchers who are still doing their PhDs, I think will prove future leaders, whether in egocentric or otherwise. I don't think that's that, that really matters. Depends on what they want to do in their research. I haven't done exactly what my PhD advisor is has worked on, I've changed, but I learned so much at that time. Um, and I, I hope that that you will see impactful, brilliant, large scale projects from all members of the team. Hazel, Davide, Mike, Toby, Will, Johnny, Vangelis, also our collaborators in Catania, Antonino and Giovanni. Um, so I think the the what we've learned, the skill sets we've learned, the experience, and I told you the experience really play such an impact as we collect future projects. I advise you to stay tuned with the future careers of these people. I very much believe in what they can do and not necessarily in, in research and not necessarily in egocentric, but they would be future leaders. And that's the long-term impact of Epic Kitchens beyond the lessons I'm telling you within research. Again, thanks for the opportunity to tell you about the project. I haven't looked at how long the video is. I hope it's not too long. And I look forward to hearing maybe opinions or questions that you might have when we meet in the workshop about stories shared and lessons learned. Thank you very much.